Hello YouTube. Thank you for clicking on this video and shout out to Big Daddy Algorithm for pimping it out to you. My name is Megan and welcome to my channel. I am a self-taught historical sewist and I recreate garments that I see in fashion plates, museums, and portraits entirely by hand using only the tools and techniques that would have been available to a seamstress at the time of the garment's original construction. So quick project update, I am still working on my Circa 1805 Regency Overgown, the silk taffeta one with like all the Zardozzi embroidery. And because there is so much embroidery, it's taking me a while to finish it. Although the end is in sight, I'm on the last like probably five inches of embroidery left before I can actually start putting this garment together. So I will have a project update for you guys soon. If you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen my updates and um, that's kind of where I post all my project updates. So go check out my Instagram if you haven't already shameless self plug whatever let's get started so as you can see I have gotten a haircut and I love it so much I just I can't even describe to you how much I love this haircut like when I was in my 20s I had really really long hair like at one point it was down to my waist and I was really attached to my long hair it was like a huge part of my identity and um, now that I'm in my 30s I wanted something that was a little bit different from what I'd been wearing for like literally the last 10 years and I feel like I went through a lot of growth and changes in my 20s especially in my late 20s like from the age of about 27 to 29 was like a huge period of growth and learning for me and I feel like like I'm a totally different person from who I was at 26, 27 years old. So I really wanted to do something that would externally reflect all of the internal changes that I have been going through over the last five, six, seven years of my life. So I chopped off my hair and I love it so much. It is so easy to care for and literally like this hairstyle is amazing because the messier it is, the better it looks. So literally I just have to like roll out of bed and just like do this and then my hair looks fine. And I love it so much. Anyway, if you're thinking of cutting your hair off and you have long hair right now like just fucking do it don't don't hesitate I hesitated for a couple years but I finally just did it like find your balls go get your hair chopped off I swear to god you will feel so much better so anyways this hairstyle is called the French Bob um if you've seen the movie Amélie <laughs> that's kind of what made it really popular in like modern times but it actually goes back much further than that Coco Chanel had a bob that was similar to this and in the 1920s women in Paris famously chopped off their hair as like a form of rebellion against their Victorian mothers and grandmothers so it has a long and storied history and that kind of got me thinking about French fashion and the idea of like French chic and what it is and why we see Paris as being the center of fashion and why French women and kind of have the last word on what is considered chic. So I did a bit of research on that, so I'm gonna do a little bit of a deep dive for you today. So we're gonna explore the idea of France as a fashion capital and of the French woman as possessing this inimitable chic that everybody wants to replicate and whether or not she's even still relevant in the first place. So buckle up, let's go. So the first thing that I asked myself when I was just kind of diving into this topic is why Paris? Because I mean, London, New York, and Milan are big fashion cities too, but Paris is like untouchable. So what is it about Paris and about Parisian women that feels so inimitable? Why does Paris seem to have a monopoly on chic and is the Parisian woman even still relevant? And what exactly is Parisian chic anyway? It's hard to put into words, but if I was to sum it up in a few points, it would basically be less is more, natural, but not really, always leaving one thing undone, wearing lots of black or navy, messy hair and a pouty lip, having a sense of independence, of not being afraid to venture out alone to restaurants, theaters, cafes. It's about being seen as much as it is about observing the world around you. Wearing the classic mini skirt blazer and chic but comfortable shoes, walking everywhere because the gym is for Americans and we have to get our exercise somehow, although the walking everywhere thing is really more of like a city person's purview anyway. It's not really exclusive just to Paris. If you live in a city, you just walk everywhere because that's what you do. Everything's close. Why wouldn't you walk everywhere? Liking things natural, but not liking nature itself. The idea of the countryside is lovely, but in real life, it's unsettling. <laughs> Just a little bit of snobbishness, living life on your own terms and not paying too much attention to the future because who even knows if they have a future? Might as well just enjoy today and everything that the moment has to offer. Having separate bedrooms or separate apartments altogether, 
an aura of cool detachment, but with a sense of simmering intensity underneath that comes from being chewed up and spit out by love. And okay, just a side note, this is just my opinion, but I believe in general that if you're a woman, it's very important for you to lose your head in relationships with insane chemistry at least once or twice in your life. Having a bit of a steamy past with a side of heartbreak gives you texture and a kind of sexy detachment that you can carry forward with you. That is the essence of chic in my opinion, although everybody is going to have a different opinion of what chic actually is. That's why it's so hard to pin down this concept, but in general, the way you carry yourself, conduct yourself, and everything else that you do say and wear will flow from there, from what you've been through your experience and how you kind of take that with you. Remember these points, I'll come back to them later. But first, we have to understand where it all comes from to begin with. France has a rich history when it comes to fashion, and the French were the first to make an actual industry out of it way back in the 1600s. Before then, Spain was the center of culture, fashion, and music in Europe. From the 14th to the 17th centuries, aristocrats and wealthy merchants looked to Spain and Italy as well for a brief time during the Renaissance for innovations in fashion, architecture, music, and art. So they were like at the forefront of these movements. The most avant-garde and innovative fashions came from Spain, like the farthingale, which was a skirt made of a series of thin, lightweight hoops that widened out towards the feet, and they supported the skirts over top, molding them into the shape of cones. This was a huge innovation at the time, and the late 1500s was the first time in Western history that we see the use of skirt supports to achieve a specific silhouette. This was to become wildly popular in preceding centuries, and then it was to diminish again in the 1920s when like women discarded a lot of the complicated undergarments that they had worn for centuries. But this is the first time we really see the use of skirt supports and of any kind of understructure at all. So Spanish dressmakers were the first to popularize that and the French kind of took that from them and then just made it really, really popular. Royal courts all over Europe readily adopted the Spanish farthingale and Queen Elizabeth I in England really did make it iconic. Spain continued to be the European fashion capital for another hundred years or so until the reign of King Louis XIV in France, who created a cult of personality around himself in classic dictator fashion. He famously wore really over-the-top outfits, dressing up as the sun itself and wearing long curly wigs and high-heeled shoes. He placed himself at the center of the luxury goods industry, which began to flourish as all his courtiers rushed to imitate him. Towards the end of the 1600s, Louis XIV went bald, so he started wearing these outrageous, super long, curly wigs, and everyone, of course, had to copy him. Versailles became a game of one-upsmanship, as courtiers scrambled to outdo each other by wearing the longest wigs, or the tallest heels, or the widest skirts. In the 1670s, the fashion press was created in France, and for the first time in history, we see published commentary on what people were wearing and what was in style. This created the idea of different seasons of clothing and was the very, very beginning of what we now know as trend cycles. Now at the time, trend cycles moved a lot more slowly because it just took time to make the clothes, everything was done by hand, it took time for things to make the rounds throughout Europe, and it took time for things to catch on. So something would come into fashion and then it would remain in fashion for like a decade, and then something else would come in to replace it. So they still did have the same trend cycles that we have today, it just took a lot longer for them to go through them. Now of course we have TikTok and we go through trend cycles in like four months. Like seriously, I've seen like three different decades come in and out of fashion on TikTok talk in like the last six months it's insane so hey I mean if you want me to do a video on that at some point I totally can because trend cycles are like a whole other thing and I have a lot of opinions about that but yeah let me know in the comments if you care about that or if you want to hear more Anyway, so the fashion press at the time was a series of periodicals like La Mode Illustre and Galerie des Modes, which featured illustrations of fashionable people that were captured by artists while they were out and about. These illustrations were then published with commentary on what was being worn, what trimmings were used, what type of fabric, accessories, etc., and people would then rush to copy them. So like at the time, new fashions were created by people going to their dressmakers and saying like, hey, I love this color, I wanna wear it, or hey, I just really love this flower, let's put that all over my dress, and then they would go and they would wear that out in Paris, and then the people who worked at these fashion publications would be out there like searching for people to sketch, and then they would see someone in a cool outfit, sketch them down, publish that everywhere and then that would become like the new fashion so 
fashions were a little bit more grassroots and organic versus now when we have them like dictated by big fashion brands and fashion magazines at the time the magazines literally just reported on what people themselves were wearing so it was a totally different process but before the fashion press came along styles were communicated through miniature and life-size dolls called pandoras which were dressed up in the latest fashions by french spanish and venetian dressmakers and sent around to the various european courts Pandoras were in use as early as the 15th century, and they were used as a vehicle of fashion to inform aristocrats and wealthy merchants all over Europe of the latest fashions coming from different capitals. So Pandoras could be either life-sized or they could be like small 18-inch dolls that dressmakers would put in like a sample of one of their gowns. And so you would receive a Pandora, you would like look at what they were wearing and then decide if you wanted to order that kind of gown in your own size. And that was kind of the only way that fashion could be communicated at the time until the fashion press came along. The idea of the fashion doll is still with us today because that's what Barbie is. So that's where that comes from. The French fashion press revolutionized how new styles were communicated because instead of sending dolls, you could now just send papers and magazines, which were lighter and easier to transport. This also meant that new fashions could spread even faster than ever before. And since the fashion press was entirely French at that time, French fashions were the ones making the rounds throughout Europe in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. By the mid 18th century, France had overtaken in Spain and established itself as the fashion capital of Europe and French styles were considered superior. France's luxury goods industry was booming, and silks from Lyon, porcelain from Sèvres, and leather gloves, hats, shoes, and perfumes from Paris were in high demand. French dressmakers, or mantua makers as they're properly called, were all women, and they knew and understood women's bodies and desires. And you can go check out my video on men making fun of women's fashion if you're interested in the Mantua Makers Guild and how it laid the groundwork for the first wave of feminism. I'll go link that below because it's a really interesting topic. Because they had such easy access to these fashions and luxury items, French women were thought to be the most fashionable and elegant, and they were envied and copied by other women all over Europe. Enter Marie Antoinette, the Austrian Archduchess who married the heir to the French throne. When she became the Queen of France in 1774, she embarked on a mission to make herself into the most stylish woman in Europe. This was a radical departure from the established role of the French Queen, whose job it had always been to set an example of virtuous Christian womanhood. The queen was expected to always be dressed in her finest, but not to be at the cutting edge of fashion. She modestly followed the fashions, but she didn't actually dictate them. Kind of like how British royalty still operates. Like we see the Princess of Wales dressed in these like timeless little suits and elegant tailored coats, but we would never ever see Kate Middleton prancing around London in a pair of cargo pants, a crop top and platform boots, even though that's what's in fashion right now. You just wouldn't see her wearing that. Setting the tone for fashion at the French court was exclusively the job of the king's mistress at this time. It was expected that the king of France would have a favorite mistress, among many, and there was actually an established role and a title for this lucky, lucky woman, the maîtresse en titre, literally the titled mistress. Her job was basically to act as a messenger to the king for any ambitious courtiers who wanted his ear for whatever reason. The royal mistresses were also expected to be fashionable and avant-garde in their tastes, setting the role for what was stylish at court. Some of them rose to such meteoric fame and success that we still remember them today, like the Marquise de Pompadour and Madame de la Valliere and Madame du Barry. Louis XIV and Louis XV were infamous for their mistresses, but Louis XVI, who was Marie Antoinette's husband, was more reserved and he had really strict morals around adultery. He was also shy and like kind of intimidated by women, and he was hyper-focused on his hobbies, which included hunting, locksmithing, and studying history. Honestly, he was probably on the asexual spectrum somewhere, but people weren't aware of asexuality at the time, so he was just kind of seen as like being a bit of an oddball by the courtiers and by the people of France for being faithful to his wife, like this was seen as weird. His refusal to take a mistress put Marie Antoinette in the awkward position of having to play both the role of virtuous queen and the role of the sexy, fashionable mistress at the same time. It was like the Madonna whore complex of the French court had just completely projected itself onto her in like full force. Being a young, artistic, and wildly creative person, however, she enthusiastically adopted this role and threw herself into the serious business of transforming into the most fashionable woman ever, TM. She hired Rose Bertin, an up-and-coming stylist from Paris, who owned a fashionable shop where she sold accessories and trimmings for gowns. She didn't actually make the gowns herself because there were strict laws in France at the time which separated the mantua makers, who were the ones actually sewing the dresses, from the modistes, who were the ones who styled and personalized them for their clients. 
So basically, under the laws of the guild system, if you were a mantua maker, you could only make dresses and nothing else, and if you were a milliner or a modiste, you could only make accessories and style gowns that were already made. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's pretty much a whole other video in and of itself, and I'm not gonna get into the whole guild system right now. There's just a lot to unpack, and I don't have time, and that's not what this video is about. You guys came here for French fashion. Basically, Rose Bertin bought ready-made gowns from the mantua makers, and then she styled them up into different aesthetics, added hats, shoes, and gloves to complete the look, and then sold them to her clients. It's really hard to explain this to modern people because we don't have anything similar to compare it to in like our world, but it would be kind of like if there was a whole job category where all that someone did for a living was to buy up like 20 of the same dress and then add accessories to it. So you'd have like a cottage core version and a dark academia version and like a goth or eagle version, etc. That's basically what Rose Bertin did, like that was her entire business model. So these outfits were then purchased by her customers and they were hella expensive. She was wildly popular with wealthy Parisian women, so Marie Antoinette hired her on retainer and then struck a deal with her that she was to create all of her new ensembles exclusively for the queen and then she wouldn't be allowed to sell them to anyone else until after the queen had already worn them. So basically what this did was place Marie Antoinette at the helm of Europe's fashion ship literally overnight and because she had that air of exclusivity, everyone rushed to copy her. And the French fashion press used her as a model to illustrate new styles in periodicals that were then sent all over Europe. Because of this patronage from the Queen, Rose Bertin's business boomed and she became fabulously wealthy, even richer than the Queen herself. All of a sudden, the chic French woman had a name and a face and that was really when this idea of the Parisian woman became like a thing that people wanted to imitate. Marie Antoinette got a lot of criticism from more conservative courtiers and politicians for like really leaning into this fashionable artist thing and mostly ignoring her role as a motherly, virtuous, modest queen. She was actually a very good mother. She had four children and like famously doted on them, but she preferred to live this part of her life in private. And so like her entire public persona was like the fashion plate of France. And that's what people saw of her. Instead of leading the nation in good Catholic values, she was leading them in fashion, which had always been the job of the royal mistresses, not the queen. So after a while, she was thought of as being slightly more whore than Madonna, and that fed into all the negative press that she received during the revolution and ultimately played a role in her demise. After the French Revolution, fashions changed again. The new silhouettes were a radical departure from the imaginative, maximalist, and overly trimmed gowns of the 18th century, and they were a response to the more somber and serious political climate in France that had begun in 1789. I did a whole last video on Regency fashion and its origins, so go check that out if you're interested in that era and want to learn more. I don't have time to get into it now. I'll just link it below if you want to take a boo through that. Anyway, so the revolution had changed pretty much everything in France, but it hadn't at all diminished its status as the most fashionable place in Europe. France had been the birthplace of Enlightenment philosophy through 18th century writers like Rousseau and Voltaire, and their ideas of democracy, liberty, and capitalism were exported right along with French fashion during and after the revolution. The new Regency styles were enthusiastically adopted all over Europe as a tangible embodiment of new and modern ideas. England in particular embraced the new silhouettes since it had already been a nation of limited monarchy and a robust merchant class since about the mid 17th century. The new styles aligned with traditionally English aesthetics of sensible and functional simplicity, which is what we see in our favorite Jane Austen movies. In any case, by the year 1800, France had solidified itself as the center of fashion in Europe, and as the revolution simmered down and people began to travel to Paris again, it became a status symbol to go there and have your clothes made by Parisian dressmakers. Instead of courtiers and aristocrats, France now had the bourgeoisie, the wealthy merchant class that had come out on top during the revolution. They were the driving force behind the economy, and they could actually move money around, unlike the aristocrats of the old regime, whose wealth had been all tied up in landed estates, which had been in their families for centuries. The merchants were almost always men, and as France became a capitalist nation, the old medieval guild system disappeared, which meant that the female mantua makers, milliners, and modistes of Marie Antoinette's time disappeared as well, and they were no longer allowed to do business because they were women. Yeah, newsflash, capitalism is patriarchal. <laughs> 
From the bourgeoisie arose a cohort of couturiers who wanted a slice of the pie of France's luxury goods industry. They were mostly men and they strictly designed the fashions, while the seamstresses, the female seamstresses, on their payroll were the ones who actually made the clothes that they designed. This was very different from how fashions had been made during the previous century when clothing was designed by the women who would actually be wearing it in collaboration with their mantua makers who would then make up the garments that they had designed together. The new couturier, on the other hand, designed the clothes all by himself without any input from his clientele. You either liked his work or you didn't, and if you did like it, then you would order his clothes and his army of seamstresses would make them up for you to your measurements, and thus was born the fashion house and the fashion designer. So this is when we see the transition from fashion as a collaborative, grassroots, cooperative, and highly personalized process to fashion as an aesthetic that was dictated to women by men. This is still the case today, although we're thankfully seeing a lot more female creative directors in the big fashion houses now. But that's another video for another day. And I was actually in the process of researching a video on like men dictating women's fashion and how like when fashion is seen through the male gaze, it becomes like very basic and unimaginative versus when we see fashion through the female gaze, it's a lot more creative, elaborate, and a lot more innovative. So that's a topic that I will probably be doing in the near future. I just got sidetracked by my haircut and by my like curiosity on French chic. So look out for that video. I'll be doing that maybe next, who knows. Anyway, probably the most famous designer of the 19th century was Charles Worth, who was actually an English dude. He founded the House of Worth in 1858 in Paris, from which he ruled over the fashion industry with an iron fist for the remainder of the 19th century. He was the first person to be considered a true designer in the sense that we know them today, not just your average Joe dressmaker, and fashion historians credit him with being like the father of haute couture. He actually invented the fashion show, which at the time was basically just a bunch of models walking around his Parisian atelier dressed up in his latest creations, and he was one of the first to actually prepare a collection of clothes to show in advance. He was at the vanguard of fashion for over half a century, and he enjoyed the patronage of many famous European royal women at the time, like Empress Eugenie, who was the wife of Napoleon III of France, and Empress Elizabeth of Austria. He's credited with inventing the bustle gown and popularizing the cage crinoline, and his work is just absolutely stunning, like true moving wearable art. Every historical costumer has a favorite worth gown that we dream of recreating, and mine is the butterfly dress from 1912. Like, I love this dress so much. Just all of the beadwork and like the chiffon overlay on top of the sequins and the duchess satin underskirt, and like, oh, it's just so, so pretty. One of these days I'm gonna recreate it when I'm over like this insane embroidery project that I'm doing right now. And I feel like spending another six months sewing tiny little microscopic seed beads onto silk chiffon, then I will probably tackle this, but I can just drool over it right now cause like it's so pretty guys. Anyway, as American industries began to boom throughout the 19th century, a capitalist class came out on top there too, just like it had in France in the early 1800s. And it became fashionable for railroad, rail, railroad, uh, railroad, Railroad. It became fashionable for railroad tycoons. God, that's a tongue twister. And steel barons and wealthy bankers to send their wives and daughters to Paris to have their wardrobes made and brought back to the US. It was a status thing to be able to say that the dress you were wearing was made in Paris while you were sitting on a porch somewhere in Georgia with sweat running down your ass crack, sipping tea with the plantation owner's wife next door. And the status of French clothes as being superior to American ones pretty much continued throughout the 20th century as well. Even nowadays, American designers like Kate Spade and Michael Kors are seen more as like brand names than as true fashion houses on the same tier as Chanel and Hermes, or even Celine and Balenciaga. Although I guess Balenciaga is canceled now. Let me know if you want me to do a video on that because boy do I have some opinions. Anyway, back to history. In 1858, the world's first department store opened up in Paris. Le Bon Marché Rive Gauche was designed by the same architect who built the Eiffel Tower, and it was the first time that fashion, accessories, furniture, tableware, and contemporary works of art were offered for sale all in one place, all under one roof, right in the middle of Paris. I really can't emphasize enough how revolutionary a concept the department store was because department stores are in such steep decline right now, if not entirely obsolete, that it's hard for us modern people to wrap our heads around just how new and novel Le Bon Marché was at the time. 
Fashion at that time went beyond just the clothes and accessories you wore. It also dictated things like how you set your table and what you served at dinner and what topics of conversation you had with your friends and acquaintances. To be in the fashion was to live a certain lifestyle and project a certain image that permeated into every tiny little facet of your existence. This had been the case for centuries. This was not a new idea, but the creation of the department store meant that for the first time in history, you could go to one single place and obtain everything you needed to be in in the fashion all at one time. And this place in the 1850s was in Paris at Le Bon Marché. You best believe people flocked here from all over the world and it wasn't long before similar stores popped up in London and New York as well. This was truly the beginning of a new kind of consumption that would really take off in the 20th century, eventually leading to the creation of standardized sizing and ready to wear clothing that people could just buy off the rack. But that is a topic for an entirely separate video because there's a lot to unpack in there. Carrying on in the tradition of the French fashion press, Vogue was founded in 1892, several decades after the opening of Le Bon Marché and the House of Worth. And that's when the French fashion industry really exploded. And then we fast forward to the 1920s when Gabrielle Chanel, an orphan from the south of France, made her way to Paris with her lover, Boy Capel, who set her up with a little hat shop and an apartment in the city. Her designs were characterized by a simplicity that was in direct contrast to the frilly, complicated Victorian fashions that she had grown up with. Her hat shop became wildly popular, so she began to also design clothes for women in comfortable jersey knits, which was a revolutionary fabric at the time, with masculine cuts and feminine details. The clothes were simple, practical, and beautiful, made for the 20th century woman who would be taking the subway and riding the streetcar and going out to nightclubs. Her signature bobbed haircut, and loose, comfortable, well-tailored clothing were copied by the fashionable Parisian women who patronized her shop, and she's credited with ushering in that iconic 1920s flapper style that really set the tone for women's clothing right up until today. So the 1920s was the first time in history that women started discarding all of those complicated undergarments that they had worn basically since the 1500s and underwear just became like a bra and panties and a slip and then you would wear your dress over top of that. And that's pretty much, you know, what we wear today, except maybe the slip. Well, I mean, I wear slip dresses as like dresses, as do many women because they're hella comfortable, hella pretty, and they go with fucking everything. But at the time, the slip was something that you wore underneath your clothing and fashion just kind of evolved from there. That really set the tone for what we wear today. And this was a huge radical departure from like everything that had ever been worn before in history. Although Marie Antoinette and to some extent the Marquise de Pompadour before her pioneered the idea of the fashionable French woman, when we think of the chic, enigmatic, modern Parisian girl, Coco Chanel was really the first person to embody this. She was followed in rapid succession by a number of designers who will be familiar to most of us today, like L'Anvin, Schiaparelli, Louis Vuitton, Hermes, Balmain, Balenciaga, and on and on it goes. During the post-war period in the 1940s and 50s, Christian Dior, yes, another French guy, created a sensation with his new look, returning women to a more structured and feminine silhouette and moving away from the androgyny that Chanel had made popular 20 years before. And the rest you pretty much already know. Eau couture is a French term and it comes from a long history with a rich tradition of textiles, luxury goods, and styles that have been exported to the rest of the world from France since the 1670s. Nowadays, fashion is serious business in France. It's not just about wearing pretty clothes. It exists somewhere between art and consumerism, with multiple museums in Paris being dedicated to textiles, textile history, and showcasing the work of iconic fashion houses. The government of France robustly funds art and culture, of which fashion is a big part, and if a designer wants to be granted status as a couture house, there are strict rules that they have to follow. Regulations for fashion houses are set out by the Fédération de la Haute Couture et de la Mode, an organization that helps to consolidate Paris in its role as world fashion capital, in particular thanks to Paris Fashion Week and Haute Couture Week, which it coordinates. These rules are a form of quality control and they protect the traditions and reputation of the French couturiers. Not a lot of people know just how regulated the fashion industry is in France and it blew my mind when I found out. If you're a budding designer and you wanna to move to Paris and set up your own fashion house, you'll have to follow these rules in order to play. Number one, a house must produce 50 new and original designs of day and evening wear for each collection. Number two, a house must show two collections per year. And number three, a house must employ a minimum of 20 full-time technical people, so like seamstresses, embroiderers, leather workers, etc., in at least one atelier or workshop. 
Regulations are so strict that only a few fashion houses actually qualify to use the Haute Couture label, and those who pass are entitled to free advertising on state-run French television. Now you know. The first Paris Fashion Week took place on November 28, 1973, and it was held as a fundraiser for the Palace of Versailles, which needed help raising money for renovations on the royal residences, bringing the relationship between the French fashion industry and the French aristocracy back full circle. So basically, fashion is to France what sports are to America, and the Parisian woman is at the center of it all. She embodies all the points that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, remember how I told you to remember them, and she's someone who has access to and embodies the long history and rich traditions of the French fashion industry. She oozes chic from every pore. She's elegant and fashionable, but also a bit gritty and a walking contradiction. She's Marie Antoinette as both Madonna and whore. She's Josephine Baker as both glamour girl and freedom fighter. She's Jane Birkin as both sophisticated and carefree, Coco Chanel as both feminine and masculine, and Romy Schneider as both fragile and strong. So who actually is the Parisian woman? Plot twist, she doesn't exist. None of the women I just mentioned as living, breathing embodiments of Parisian chic were actually Parisian at all. The only one who was even French was Coco Chanel. Marie Antoinette was Austrian, Jane Birkin and Josephine Baker were American, and Romy Schneider was German. Real, actual, flesh and blood Parisian women are diverse with a diversity of interests and priorities. They come from all different backgrounds and cultures, and just like women anywhere else in the world, they're not a monolith. Being expected to perform French chic just because you live in Paris is exhausting and expensive, and a lot of younger Parisian women are rebelling against it. And added to that, a lot of fashions are now becoming Americanized with the rise of like streetwear and loungewear, especially since 2020. Like right now, cargo pants and nylon parachute pants are really fashionable. This is not considered like Parisian chic at all. This is very American, very streetwear focused. And so it leaves us questioning whether the idea of French chic is even still relevant at all. Add to that all of the really valid criticisms of the fashion industry that have come to light in recent years, plus the number of crises that we as a society are facing it sort of begs the question of whether or not this is even something that we want to imitate. Do we want to perform French chic? What exactly does it embody? And is that something that we're comfortable with projecting out there into the world? I don't have the answers to these questions. That is a very personal thing that we all have to decide for ourselves. But I know that personally, I will always be fascinated by the idea of the French woman because I relate to her in a lot of ways. All of those points that I mentioned at the beginning of the video are things that I myself do in my own life and that I myself really strongly believe in. And so for me, the idea of the French woman and what she embodies really feels natural and it, it feels like me. It feels like who I am, like deep at my core. So for me, this idea will always be relevant. But that's not to say that it is relevant to everybody or that's something that everybody should strive to imitate. In general, I think that you need to be who you are at your core. You need to project that into the world and there is a place for you no matter who you are or what you believe. And regardless of what you think about fashion or about Paris, whether you think it's cheesy and outdated or whether it's something that you also love, the aura of the Parisian woman still lives on. Those of us who eat, sleep, and breathe fashion still idolize Paris and what it represents. And the fact that the Parisian woman is a myth means that anyone can become her regardless of where you actually live. I live in a shitty Canadian suburb and I like to think that in my heart of hearts I'm just as much of a Parisian woman as a chic young professional with an apartment in the Marais. But maybe I'm totally delusional, let me know in the comments if I'm out to lunch. So that's all for now my loves, thank you for joining me on this brief journey through French fashion history, it was a blast. Um, I'm gonna go wash off my makeup and put on my very un-chic sweatpants and get back to my sewing. But this has been really fun to research and put together, so let me know if you're interested in the history of fashion in other places too. It would be really cool to do a deep dive into like London, New York, Milan, or even India with its rich traditions of textile manufacturing and embroiderers. Have an awesome, awesome day, and I will see you all in the next one. Toodaloo!